Hello everyone. Um, I, since my, uh, you know, since my phone camera flunked out, I got, I got my hands on this web camera. So I'm glad for that. And I'm glad that I got my hands on it a while ago. Um, so I decided why not just record stuff with this web camera. So, you know, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm very glad I have that. I'm very glad I have the microphone. I just never thought I'd use it for this. Um, so, oh, shadow. So, yeah, and I I really don't want to show myself because it's literally 2.30 in the morning. And I'm in my pajamas. And I'm having to record this at night again. So, this is, because the other video didn't have a good and proper ending, and because I, the the phone cut itself off. It just... Thankfully, it, it saved the video, so, you know, obviously, because I was able to upload it, but it, it cut itself off, and I'm just really just putting a good and proper ending to it, because I can't stand it when people's videos just cut off like that. So, uh, yeah, this is my near-death experiences part 2A, as you can read here, losing my religion, and um, again, this is rated R. Because even adults cannot handle this, and it's just the truth. So, yeah, there's really not much else to say other than the ghost that came and saved me. Uh, it was a male. It was a guy, you know. I I swear he's still around. I swear that he's real. You know, but I, I can swear forward, backward, and sideways that something is real and that this actually happened all I want, but that doesn't mean that, you know, a ghost actually came to me, you know. This this terrible incident with the Christianity thing. Um, and by the way, there was another thing that I remembered. My parents were the ones who were Christians. And they were... My dad was a big-time alcoholic, and he uh, ended up, you know, being told to basically, at that time, it was, you know, like a poor man's rehab AA. He basically was told to go to AA or you'll lose your job, and so thankfully, he took the smarter approach, and he decided to go to AA, and AA said, you know, you need a religion, you need a God to help you through this. And he worked all the steps. Well, that's well and good and all. But when they came down here, my dad clearly figured out that if you do anything in the name of religion, you can get away with it. You can rape people in the name of religion. Those priests have shown it and get away with it. You can deprive people of food and water and get away with it. You can... I mean, look at the people who are denying their children, you know, medical care and vaccinations, and they're, they're able to do it. So my dad, being abusive, he and my mom decided to exercise me, which was absolutely horrific. Using their God and their religion, and, and I, I was a big-time Christian, before this. In fact, right before this, I was actually fasting and I had fasted for 10 days, begging God to save me from my abusive parents and to save me from the abusive teachers down south and um, to save me from all of it. And instead of saving me from any of it, and, and really I was begging God to let me go back up to Minnesota, let my family moved back up to Minnesota, just let me get out of what I was actually wanting was escape and to let me, you know, get me out of my family. You know, at the time, I just wanted things to get better. I was literally fasting, hoping that God would hear me and just give me something, let things get better for me. And, um, and it didn't, it got so incredibly bad. It was just out of mind. It was absolutely horrific and you know you figure that that would have broken you know sorry 
I need to put this more on camera. You would figure that that would have broken my tie to religion. But I was so brainwashed in it and so seeped in it. You know, uh, there's this group. What do they call it? I think they call it Recovering from Religion. Recoveringfromreligion.org. I'm positive. Google it. Look it up. Um, but they have a podcast and it has been very healing. And in it, they state something that is very truthful. Listen to all their podcasts. They only have like two years worth, but it is, it is excellent. Their podcasts. And oh my God, it is just, they are so good. But in it, they state that it is shocking the justification that people go through and they keep on, you know, the, the two speakers that do this podcast, they, you know, they actually talk about, you know, why in the world didn't we walk away from this, re, you know, our religions, you know, before this, why, you know, especially the younger guy uh, who, who doesn't have cancer. I think they actually stopped doing it because the older guy has cancer and he was, it looked like he was checking out and I really liked him the most. I really liked him the most. The younger guy is very much like a machine and he said, you know, I, you know, I'm very logical and everything and he couldn't figure out why looking back he never walked away from from this evangelical Christian nonsense. He just he couldn't figure it out and he just, you know, and they both said you just have a tendency to kick yourself and you know, they they realized when you're raised in it. You know, Oprah said something that stuck in my mind that is true today and and it just it explains it when you're driving crazy's car when you're living in crazy's house when you're eating crazy's food it's hard to get away from crazy and being young and not old enough to work you know and being out in literally I mean, back in the 90s, nothing was, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, nothing was built up here where we're living. So, I mean, it was, we were out in the podunks, you know, we were out in the backwoods, as my dad always called it. So that just gives you that much more liberty and and the little town that they dragged us to to exercise the hell out of me was even more backwoods and more because it was it was poverty stricken. It was uh, I ended up finding out it was the place where supposedly a, a lot of black people had lived back in the day when I mean, they ended up having to take a sign down upon federal orders, I guess, in the year 1980, exactly, that said, you know, no black people allowed beyond this point and uh so apparently the town that they dragged me to was the town that I guess a lot of black people had lived in because I mean I don't know but that's the impression I was given so it was I mean it was really out there in the middle of nowhere and it was just it was horrible so but yeah this is kind of getting on a tangent Sorry. And, and I don't mean anything negative. I don't mean anything, you know, it's just. You would figure that being exercised, I would walk away from religion entirely, but it scared me so bad that I was screaming out to Jesus Christ to save me anyway. But it's like every time I screamed out to Jesus Christ, it's like. It was like the horrible demons that my parents stuffed in me through those exorcisms answered me instead and things got even so much worse for me spiritually so much worse for me mentally so much worse for me physically I mean my my grades rightfully so dumped out I mean they were bad before but it was like d's and c's and then it was finally I mean after they did that it was pure f's you know pure f's there was just no you know and it's because of what they did to me. It was horrible. You know, I didn't have brains because there was, there was literally at one point my dad leaned on my rib cage and I didn't know that the human body could groan like a house. 
being put under pressure, it, it literally sounded like, you know, have you ever heard a house twist in a tornado? How the whole thing, it's like you can hear all the wood that builds up the rib cage, the foundation of that house. You can hear it groan and do this kind of like screaming groan whine right before it breaks. That's what my rib cage did. Because my dad put the full of his body weight on my sternum, on my rib cage, and he pounded my head a on this concrete floor and it made me lose. Now I understand the meaning of I'll knock you back into Tuesday. Well, what that means is I'll make you, I'll give you such a head injury that you won't be able to remember anything past last Tuesday. And that's what happened to me. I lost three days so that if you ask me what I had for dinner and I've had mem terrible memory problems ever since then horrific memory. Before then, I had good, I had some of the most excellent memory. But after that, I, I literally could not remember the past three days. If you asked me what I had for dinner yesterday, I would tell you the dinner that I had had three days ago. And I wouldn't be able to remember the three days that had happened. As time went on, I slowly over the course of my life, over the course of my teen years, over the course of my early adulthood, I did heal enough so that I could remember, you know, two days, you know, so I, I would forget the past two days, but I would remember the third day, you know, so like, say, say it's Wednesday, I wouldn't be able to remember Tuesday or Monday, but I'd be able to remember Sunday. But before that, I would not be able to remember, if it's Wednesday, I would not be able to remember Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, but I would be able to remember Saturday. And I would think that Saturday was yesterday, you know, and I still have memory problems, but it's, I mean, the things they put me through was horrible. And you would figure that I would have walked away from Christianity and I should have. But I was desperate spiritually and mentally and socially. And being a kid, I wasn't even worried about finances because it just wasn't part of my world. I mean, it definitely was part of my world because, again, when I was 15, my mom, this, this is going more into my life story than it is, <laughs> than it is my near-death experience. So... Like I said, I go on really long tangents and it's, it's already at 12 minutes. So, um, so yeah, my mom is a horrific hoarder and she decided to, you know, she's always decided to spend money on whenever she bought food, it was, we could never touch it and it would go moldy in the cabinets and in the fridge and we would get beaten very bad and screamed at our hair pulled, spanked horribly, just horrible things if we ate the food, you know, and I, I was hurt very badly, told that I was wasting food when I started trying to cook, because I was like, that's it, I'm going to cook. And I was screamed that horrifically. I mean, my parents turned my brother and sister against me because I'm the bad one that's actually cooking and that's actually cleaning, you know, and I was, my dad always called it a garbage scow, and he said that my mom's a pack rat, and he would just be very violent with her. So when I was 15, even though, I mean, I was living in a house that had bugs all over it, I was starving, I didn't have any pajamas, I was sleeping on a filthy floor that had mold in it because the roof was leaking, and we were renting houses. This was a rented house, you know? I mean, the things that we did to these houses, not because we wanted to, but because, I mean, there was shit on the floor. It was horrific. There was wild animals coming in, you know, because there, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, like the rentals were bad enough, but when we would move in, we would just, 
my parents would annihilate the place. And it was with my mother's hoarding and her and my parents' refusal to actually be good stewards of anything that they had. They they wanted everything to just be perfect for them. And they wanted everyone else to do the hard work of cleaning and cooking, but they never want and they wanted to take credit for it. And my mom has done that my whole life. But I just realized that I'm getting off on a massive tangent. And this has nothing really to do with my near-death experience. So, but yeah, that's how desperate I was. Still screaming out to a god. And it finally took a guy raping me for me to finally go, fuck this Christ and fuck this religion. But then... Even when I was dying, I was so desperate. I was still calling out to this God that never saved me, never loved me, and was picking on me as I died and calling me a deadbeat and calling me worthless. I was, so there you go. When you're desperate and you don't know who or what to call out to, you call out to worthlessness anyway. So I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, there's a lot more information that I was wanting to put out there in the world and tell everyone about it. Because I believe my mom raised me to tell the truth and to tell everything and to not hide anything. Don't have any family secrets. Don't have anything in the closet. And then the second I started telling about her, and the horrible things that she's done, and dad, and the horrible things that she's done, she's not only tried to make me out to be a liar and denied everything, she has screamed at me to shut up. She told me that I should not be telling any of this stuff, and I don't know why. I mean, I'm sorry, but I call myself socially retarded because I really am. My sister says that I need to be more tactful and that I need to say socially inept. So fine, I'm socially inept. The damn quacks want to call me Asperger's or they said it was high functioning autism and that I was like two points away from being like midline functioning autistic. But it's just like... And that, that plays in the near death thing because my brain... Those drugs that the those doctors shot me full of, I could feel it. It's like my brain was trying to hallucinate and it didn't have the capacity to hallucinate because my brain is just not made like that. So for me to literally physically, sort of physically see a ghost and a ghost's legs laid over the top of my legs. And this, this, is, this was an old fat white guy who had those nasty old fashioned black socks on his feet. Like, like my dad wears and like my grandpa wears, you know, like all these old army guys wear. It's like, oh my God, that is so ugly and gross. Why? You know, and I just, it's, I mean, so it's like my brain is not made to hallucinate, but what else could that be? But the drugs and the hallucination I mean, I, 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 I don't know what to think. And I do want to say, the other thing I want to say is that this guy, he, he, uh, you know, he gave me love, platonic love, like family love. I don't know what to call it. I mean, there is no such thing as family love. That's pretty damn, damn obvious. I mean, that's just, duh. Uh. But it, it, it was platonic love. And I don't know, I, I don't know how else to explain this. It's like he had fatherly love for me, like a dad, like fatherly love. And he likes being called a superhero, you know, with like a cape, like, am I your superhero? And I'm like, yeah, sure. But you're really more a Christ and a savior than a superhero. But he likes being called a superhero, you know? I mean, he's really, he's really wonderful. He's really childish like that. I mean, I like it. It's cool. But I just, for me, there's no such thing as, you know, I mean, I looked to Jesus Christ in my darkest hours when I was in middle, when I was 12, when I was 11, when I was 10, when I, when my dad was being horrifically abusive before he ever even exercised me. I was looking to Jesus Christ to be my father and Jesus Christ was not my father. I reached out in my heart and my soul. I, I found out now that I actually 
am a channeler and an empath. And and for the life of me, every time I reached out to Jesus Christ for that fatherly love, I did not get it. I got the exact opposite if if I got anything at all. It, it was just, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And yet here a ghost comes along and gives me fatherly love when I don't need it anymore. Because I was like, what was I, 34? I mean, I'm 40 now. But, you know... 34, I don't want parents anymore. I don't need parents. You know, I, that's the last thing in the world I want and need. You know, what I need now is, you know, like a spouse or a friend, you know, someone, you know, but I don't know. It's just, and, and he's kind of like, he's very much like a sibling or a, a brother, but one that doesn't pick on me. And one who it's like, it's like he was the dad that, the dad that you're supposed to be when you're a dad and it's like he gave me the dad love that I never got and it's like he was the brother that I was supposed to have when you you know and it's like I got the love of an actual brother that I never got you know and it you know I mean I don't know how else to explain it I mean it's wonderful and I can't and I'm just sitting here going clearly my mind I needed these things so bad that I created them for myself but I I'm telling you I didn't need a parent I and I especially didn't need a father you know not by that time and as for a brother no I didn't need siblings what I always wanted was a friend and I guess I kind of got friend love through him but I mean, I don't know how my mind can create these things. I mean, there's no way my mind could have created this when I don't know what it is. Your brain can't create something that it has. There's there's nothing to recall. There's nothing to recollect. I got the exact opposite. To me, father is abuse and it's evilness, you know, darkness that knows no bounds you know the depth and breadth and evilness of it is just beyond anything that is what father means to me that is what that is what god means to me that is what jesus christ means to me now very much so that is what you know that is what family means to me that is what brothers and sisters mean to me i mean that is what people mean to me i don't like people anymore i'm very much against people there's a reason why i'm a hermit so yeah i mean but yeah, it, this is getting to the 22 mark. Um, and I just, my heart and soul is speaking and I just want to keep pouring out, but it's at the 22 mark and I really need to, uh, I really need to cut this video off. But yeah, and I'm, I, to this day, I am grateful for this ghost guy because he got my dad to be a lot nicer to me and to be less abusive to me I swear to god he actually got it was very weird but he got my family to treat me nice way nicer than they were treating me um that I absolutely love um he, he did other things too but most importantly over all of it most importantly uh You know, he thinks that the most important thing is that he made me happy. For me, personally, the most important thing is that he cured my kidneys. It it was a slow fight, you know, which is unfortunate. I wanted it to be overnight, you know, like, hey, you're well now, you know. But, you know, I'm I'm way healthier than I was. And I I swear it's because of this ghost. It's because of this ghost. And so, yeah. And so the only other thing I want to remind everyone of, my God, it's at 40, 24 minutes, um, is that pity those who are dead and let's try to figure out a way to, uh, to make death a more instantaneous thing, to make death as instantaneous as possible. Because I swear to you, you know, the only other upswing that I can think of is that maybe when your blood stops moving through your body, 
you actually do fall unconscious, but I highly doubt that because it's even been proven in rats now that you can behead them and there's obviously no blood flow when you behead something. And in fact, the blood is pouring out of it, uh, out of the brain, but the nervous system still continues to work and it can continue to work for two hours. Now, if you scale that up for a human body, you know, there's, there's a lab mouse and then there's a human body. <laughs> so, oh my, you know, so if you scale that up, that means that the human body can actually and is actually alive for you know it's either going to be alive for a significantly longer amount of time after the heart stops beating and after the lungs stop breathing and after everything stops getting oxygen to it either the body is going to be and you're going to be conscious and feeling everything a lot longer than that two hours that a mouse ever is or would be or oh just so much shorter simply because you're you know you're huge compared to a mouse and from what I've from what I've experienced uh, I think it's a lot longer more than likely so yeah so just just to warn everyone that's what you're in for when you die you're gonna feel everything you're going to hear everything. You're going to experience everything. And it doesn't feel good at all to have no brains and to have lessening brain ability. And and as far as I can tell you, I, you know, from my experience, I can't explain this ghost guy, but from my personal experience, there is no stepping out of your body. There is no such thing as ghosts and you know even though I swear forwards and backwards and everything my personal experience you don't leave your body you are your body and there is no such thing as a soul so it's not like you can step out of your body and be free of whatever killed you you're gonna have to go through autopsy embalming and cremation or being buried and then having to wait until your brain and your spinal column rot away so that's a very dark note to end this on but that's why I rated this R because even adults can't handle this they would rather believe that a ghost saved me rather than what it probably was which is my system probably reset itself and whatever that neurological drug was it helped me out I guess maybe I mean I literally felt my brain get rearranged and that was another thing I, I actually heard and felt like my brain grown kind of like just like my rib cage did when my dad was hurting me so and and I'm glad that my brain got rearranged because I'm a heck of a lot better off now so I guess the drugs helped but they were very dangerous because they nearly got me to commit suicide, you know, rightfully so with everything I've been through. All I wanted was to die at the time. Now I don't want to die anymore. But I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, this whole experience, I mean, not fun. So, yeah. So ghosts could be real but this guy that that came to me he he was cremated so as far as I know I mean he was definitely cremated so maybe that's why he was able to leave his body I mean I don't I don't know anyway I'm not I'm not gonna try to figure this one out I've been going back and forth because I couldn't leave my body you know, I tried to, and I tried to, and I tried to, and I could not. There was no leaving that pain. There was no leaving that nausea. There was no leaving that torture. There just wasn't, period. 
didn't matter. It, it apparently it didn't matter that I was paralyzed and not able to, you know, I, w- I was probably starting to quit breathing. You know, I don't know. As far as I know, that wasn't the case, but who knows? But I can guarantee you that my body did full, you know, kind of like that, that last final full body seizure that the body has before it dies and in an attempt to save itself. That is definitely a, uh, kind of like a full factory reset. It's like, you know, it's like a full reset that sets your body back to like factory standard. And, and I think that's what happened to me, you know, I'm positive. And that's probably why I was so happy after that and oddly upbeat, you know? So, yeah. So if anyone else has any, you know, I don't know, near-death experiences, you know, let me know about them. (laughs) And since, since this is at the 30 minute mark and we have like you know, one step up from dial up connection. Uh, this is going to take a while, while to upload. So I'm just going to, I'm going to stop it here. Um, if anyone has any questions, I, any real questions, they're not picking on me. They're not saying that none of this happened that, you know, anyone who isn't an asshole can ask me non asshole questions. <laughs> and if I get any assholes, Well, I'm not going to answer and I will take this video down. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's it for now. Bye, everyone.